Remember, what follows is not investment advice. Do the smart thing. Bury your money in a coffee can in the backyard. I'm Arthur S. Falls, and you're listening to Beyond Bitcoin. This is an effort to bring crypto communities together in conversation and expand general consciousness of decentralized services beyond just Bitcoin. I'm privileged to speak with people who can provide insight into the issues, technologies, and trends developing in the space. The guys behind the scenes have their own outlet, hangout sessions where members of different communities regularly meet to exchange ideas and perspectives. You're invited to join in. Details at the end. During the last week, I was lucky enough to speak with Nikos Bentonitis and Panos Skurtis. It's not often you hear about a chemist and a currency trader teaming up to perform research, but such is the world we now live in. They were responsible for developing masterprotocoleducation.org. That's since been handed off to the Mastercoin community, and Nikos is now working to establish a cryptocurrency research center while Panos models the crypto economy. Pretty productive guys. After we've heard from them, Joseph Lubin of Ethereum discusses the relationship between consensus organization and hierarchical authority, as well as the superfluid economic landscape of the future. That's, that's great. Uh, thanks for connecting, Arthur. Um, so, uh, Panos and I were, you know, were excited to talk about what we've done, and uh, uh, maybe we can start whichever way makes sense for you. Well, I was really interested in asking you guys what you've learned about educating about cryptocurrency and how you feel the best way is to approach it. You know, what, what kind of metaphors and, uh, and tools and ideas you've come up with uh, in the process. Right. I, I can I can start with this and Panos, of course, can uh, share his opinions uh, af afterwards or you, Panos, feel free to interject. Uh, yes. the, our, our opinion was that uh, we, we had a burning need to find a solution ourselves for our own businesses. So uh, we, we were trying to find out the possibilities that each technology allowed and we looked at MasterCoin and wanted to learn more. So the approach for educating about cryptocurrency that's worked for us is for us to have an interest to solve a real problem and then go around, try to find uh, what technology can solve that problem and then because we do have a background, both background and education, we we shared our knowledge and our lessons in in the best way we thought would be uh, uh, appropriate for this. Uh, through in this case uh, for Mastercoin, is through videos and explanatory text. So this is the approach that we took, and uh, I, I think this is what motivated. And my background actually. In uh, education, that's that's what I learned teaching at the university level, also at the at high school level. Uh, it was when I was interested in the science. I was a chemistry professor that I was able to learn it, appreciate it, and then being able to uh, transmit it. So I guess that's number one. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, you you ask a few more questions, but uh, you mentioned what's the the best approach to do that is. You need to have a real problem that you want to solve. You need to be really interested in the technology, I believe. And then you can learn the technology as deeply as you need to learn it in order to solve your problems. <laughs> and it stems from that, really, I guess, is that familiarity and uh, and genuine enthusiasm. That's one thing I notice about all the people who I talk to about um, about cryptocurrency education is that they have that that deep enthusiasm for for the technology themselves. Definitely. Uh, what I'm kind of trying to establish is a bunch of ideas about how best to approach that education and the um, kind of the metaphors and, and models and explanatory tools that can be used to really explain some of these more esoteric concepts to not necessarily the layman, but to people who are in general unfamiliar with with cryptocurrency. Oh, I see. So you say how if there is a good metaphor that we use to explain something or if we use metaphors at all to explain <laughs> uh, concepts. Uh, 
I would have to say that metaphors. I was uh, I was uh, the king of uh, metaphors when I was teaching chemistry, <laughs> but uh, it was. Uh, I found that in the cryptocurrency space, metaphors are harder to to come by. Even uh, uh, cryptocurrency is a way to have a currency, and uh, people who even use regular currencies like the. Uh, a New Zealand dollar or the euro, they're, they're not familiar how these currencies work. So those those metaphors for me uh, sometimes can be limiting. Uh, and I think that's that's a problem in the space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I agree that uh, there's, I would say that there's not many success, successful metaphors because the audience cannot relate to too much that the metaphor would aim to to explain for instance if you're trying to talk about well, this is bitcoin bitcoin is like real money but unlike uh, I'm real money uh, like fiat money but unlike fiat money there's no central authority that prints uh you know money whenever they feel is appropriate and to some to some people of course this is a foreign concept even for people who are interested in uh, in cryptocurrencies or the fact that uh, a commercial bank can issue loans based on fractional reserve bank banking this is our all uh, uh, concept that not everybody gets uh, and when you try to compare and contrast with existing cryptocurrency methodologies those metaphors break down Anyways, what I'm trying to say is that <laughs> there maybe there are not that many good metaphors because uh, they, they're hard to come by. And also, it's a little bit hard because uh, actually cryptocurrencies, uh, it's not one thing uh, that you can explain to, to someone. I mean, there are so many aspects that you can use them because you use them as a currency, as a uh, a transfer uh, uh, network uh, as a way to transfer uh, wealth. Uh, I mean, there is not one thing. You can't tell someone uh, cryptocurrency is, is that. Right. So you have to use, uh, I guess, uh, different metaphors. Uh, but metaphors is, a, I have uh, discovered that metaphors is a good way for me to explain to someone ever here in Greece uh, why someone uh, should uh, get involved with uh, cryptocurrencies. I make a a good analogy as where well, the internet or the mobile phones were just beginning so anyone could uh, get in that new technology with different uh, in different aspects as a as a designer as a te technician whatever mm. and uh, the other good thing the other thing that uh, one i think must keep in mind that uh, people uh, well some may be auditory some might be vis visual some might be kinesthetic, so the best way is to, to use, uh, if you can, all, all the senses uh, to explain uh, an idea to, to anybody, a combination of all that stuff. You can show it, show it to him with a, with a video or an infograph, you can uh, write it down so that he can uh, read it uh, with his own pace. Uh, you can uh, make a podcast just to hear it. Uh, so yeah, it's really uh, yeah. it's really about engaging with people on their own terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree, and I, I think that uh, the metaphors that Panos mentioned are definitely the ones that we use. Panos mentioned uh, the mobile phone technology or the internet technology. People can relate to that, uh, but maybe they they have some uh, you know some limitations. I guess they you cannot explain everything. You cannot explain. Uh, Ethereum or contracts or uh, <laughs> master coin with these ideas, right? No, <laughs> yeah, you're getting way, you're going way down the rabbit hole with those ones. Yeah, yeah, and and, and some of those is I, I think I would like to add also that uh, uh, one problem with education in the cryptocurrency space is that it's impossible for people who are trying to educate others to learn about the existing technologies. There, there's so much out there. One tries to focus. We try to focus initially with MasterCoin to see MasterCoin as a representation of a class of projects that try to do something on top of the Bitcoin blockchain and we focus on that. But uh, we know in general terms what's going on, for instance, with similar uh, technologies, but we don't know them deep enough to be able to uh, explain it to everybody. 
that's kind of where we are, I guess. It's it's that um, we're just right at the beginning of these things, and there's just so much going on, and so many uh, so many loose ends. It interests me that you guys are uh, involved with Mastercoin in particular. What was what kind of brought you to Mastercoin? Uh, Panish, would you like to say something? Because I have a lot to say about that. <laughs> well, uh, the the first it was the first actual uh, 2.0 cryptocurrency that uh, was around at that uh, moment. So that's why. Uh, the, the other ones like uh, NXT or Counterparty, they just yeah. went uh, after after Mastercoin. So it was the first thing, uh, the, the first new kid we found, may I say. <laughs> that was uh, the main reason for me. Yes, that's, that's, that's for me too. And uh, we've been talking with Panos about this and we're interested in uh, learning more about Mastercoin. Uh, if we were to start today, we would go maybe with a different technology uh, and we'd try to learn more about a different technology. Uh, actually, this project that we did with Mastercoin lasted for about, uh, let's say, three and a half to four months. Uh, we're yeah. no longer uh, developing more materials about that. We reached the point where uh, uh, we were going to move on to other technologies so we can get a bigger overview of what's going on in the space. Okay, that makes sense to me. When you develop, I'm looking right now at masterprotocoleducation.org. Which, by the way, uh, is now under the control of the MasterCoin Foundation. We, we no longer update it or <laughs> okay. work on it. Mm -hmm. But you did. But uh, we are very familiar with this. <laughs> Nothing has changed since we left it. <laughs> Because you guys did come up with some uh, some pretty good resources. Maybe the more uh, this is some of the best some of the best education material on any protocol that that I've seen. Certainly the most varied. It's it's pretty impressive. Not many other not many other projects have this uh, this kind of this kind of documentation. Well, well, thank you for saying that, Arthur. I think that uh, um, uh, there's. The project have limited resources, I guess, and uh, they, some of the projects choose to focus on the development. Some people focus to uh, uh, choose to focus on community engagement. Uh, for some of these projects, education is not even in the radar. They haven't really thought about it, and uh, it's a bit of a long-term investment if you think about it. Uh, and uh, people in because. Things move so fast in the cryptocurrency space. Uh, for some some people, it's kind of hard to say. Oh well, we can invest in education that's going to give us some return later on, or should we invest on developing uh, our community or uh, getting listed in an exchange? All these more pressing issues. Yeah. So, so I think I, that's my uh, that's my opinion, and this is just my opinion. I don't know what uh, what Punish thinks about that. No, no, I agree. I totally agree with you. We do think that because uh, uh, people have different set of priorities or they prioritize issues differently, there's not enough uh, information in some, some other projects. Yeah, yeah. It's for me, it's a bit, uh, it's quite strange because, well, not strange. For me, education seems like it should be, certainly for larger projects, the uh, one of the cornerstones of, of development should be education itself so that you can actually expand your user base from this hardcore group to, you know, a more a broader community. A lot like like Doge managed to do by simply not really needing to educate people about it. Right. <laughs> it's a bit more difficult for people to to grasp what makes these projects different because they're different. Yes. Yes. And, and I think an additional aspect is once they understand more or less what the technologies do is how they can use those technologies. I think that's a big, that's, that's a big issue. That's a big step. There's several people in the cryptocurrency space who are familiar with MasterCoin and they think they know what MasterCoin is doing. But uh, if you ask them, how can I do this or that in MasterCoin, they wouldn't be able to answer uh, correctly because they, they have, not, they have not interacted with the technology. And that's because, of course, there's so little time. I just come, like to come back to that theme that there's very little time and people have to prioritize. And uh, sometimes education <laughs> is not in the top of our priorities. And so it's also the fact that uh, the technology gets uh, so fast uh, 
obsolete. I mean, it, it's age. It's not the technology, the, the education about the technology. I mean, uh, you have uh, one wallet uh, this week and uh, another one get it out in uh, two weeks. So maybe this is a reason why the cryptocurrencies in general don't uh, devote so much time and effort uh, in making something uh, explanatory about uh, the technology of theirs because it is on the go or as we speak so something that's going on this week may be not be next week oh yeah that's correct so that's might, correct. that might be a fact too yeah we have we had that experience with master protocol education so we created some videos explanatory information about one aspect of the technology and then uh, three weeks later that aspect of the technology had gone away and our our opinion was that uh, the master protocol education would be the hub where you could find the latest and the most up-to-date information for everything that's going on in the technology, even if that required new materials every two weeks about the same subject. <laughs> mm. Are you guys working on anything? Uh, uh, yes, actually, no? this is what we've really been talking about uh, recently. Our engagement with MasterCoin uh, recently ended, uh, and uh, we're trying to see where we can expand. We believe in education. Um, we we have some things that's a bit under wraps, but in, involves essentially the idea of creating, uh, let's say, a research center <laughs> on cryptocurrencies, uh, and uh, that involves not only researching existing technologies, but also looking at uh, problems that the technologies might face in the in the future. This is a, a research institution that we, uh, a center that we're trying to set up with some academic institutions in Europe and in the United States. So I would say this is one of our big projects. Uh, we're also uh, thinking about um, certain other Bitcoin 2.0 technologies that we want to learn more about. Certainly a research institute is absolutely essential. I mean, this is so, like you said, we're, this is so early in the on in the space and so much legwork is being done by these dispersed communities with no no hard center, no, you know, no hard core, to, you know, to yes. no organized core anyway. It seems like some kind of organized group that can actually explore some of the implications of what's uh, what's being developed and some of these new ideas that are coming uh, that you know that are appearing is really essential yeah yeah we, we do believe that and we're in talks with uh, universities actually uh, we're about to uh, hopefully receive some uh, written uh, commitment from uh, one of the universities but uh, we, we don't like to talk about these things unless everything is set and done of course uh, we, we don't like to pre-advertise on reddit or something like this. <laughs> we, just, we, 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 we believe that our position in the space is to be independent observers and uh, explainers of the different technologies we're not uh, we don't like to be associated with any technology per se, but we do believe that a research center is something that uh, will have uh, a good impact in this space, positive impact. Mm. So that's kind of like the, the project that's under wraps, uh, but uh, hopefully we'll soon talk more about this when it gets unwrapped. <laughs> so I get, well, um, I mean, we've talked about education and, uh, and it's, you guys are obviously have, um, have done a whole bunch in that, in that space. What about your, uh, your actual endeavors in the cryptocurrency world what are you guys trying to what are you guys producing uh using these using cryptocurrencies i understand you had something going on with with uh transport uh trans oh yeah that's my um my uh transportation uh, that is vehicle transportation but that's uh my uh consulting firm before i got i started getting involved oh, okay. in bitcoin i still have some active projects there uh, but uh, what what I'm I'll say a little bit and then Pandas can can share his uh, interest. Uh, what I'm doing right now is I'm creating uh, Coin Simple. It's a company that uh, it's a Bitcoin payment aggregator. In other words, uh, there's so many payment aggregators, including BitPay, Coinbase. There's BIPs. There's several in different countries. There's maybe a dozen or actually, and the numbers are increasing really rapidly. So what Coin Simple does is it allows for merchants to switch among these payment processors with a click of the button or with a certain um, algorithm. 
so that uh, this merchant can accept uh, for whatever reason uh, payments, Bitcoin payments from different payment uh, payment processors. We also help merchants sign up for these uh, for these payment processors because it's um, we essentially take the, the documents once and then distribute it to to others. So this is what I'm. Uh, Focus on right now, Coin Simple, and we have some funding. We got funded for that, and uh, we're hoping to have our alpha uh, by the end of June. Oh, awesome! Yeah, uh, what a- I can send you some more information uh, about please that. Please do. Yeah, yeah. Have, you've got my email address. Do you? Don't you? Oh, oh yes, I cool. Do. Yes. What about you, Panos? Panos? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's Panos. Uh, well, I I have a background with. Uh, Forex trading uh, and technical analysis, so I have a really uh, good interest in uh, creating a site uh, regarding the analyzing technically some kind, some cryptocurrencies, uh, the major ones uh, in volume, I mean. And uh, apart from the technically, I would uh, I'm, I'm also interested a lot in the fundamentally analyzing uh, what's going on and the price of them, uh, depending on the pump and dumping sometimes on the on the communities or the news. Uh, I think it's a really interesting thing to to keep an eye on and then to understand how the whole uh, uh, crypto economy works uh, on its own. I mean, inside. Uh, the cryptocurrencies and uh, how it works uh, with the, uh, let's say, outside economy, I mean, the main economy. That's something that's uh, very interesting for me. And uh, the other thing that, uh, well, we are both uh, interesting is uh, the user uh, backed up uh, currencies. Uh, we were talking with Nikos about maybe yes. creating something. Uh, Backed up, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Asset-backed cryptocurrencies. This is something that uh, interests us a lot. We have some initial contacts, and we'll see. Uh, we're still discussing how this can be uh, set up, which technology should be used, and actually, that was one of the original motivations for getting involved with Mastercoin. Uh, is to create asset-backed tradable cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies, yes. So when you say. Uh, yeah backed cryptocurrencies the big question with backed crypto is how do you actually how do you i've been speaking with this to other people how do you actually tie the uh the currency itself to an external asset that's off blockchain do you guys have any thoughts on that i know that's a big question that is floating around the space yes (laughs) yeah maybe if if uh, an asset could be Linked directly to a blockchain, it would be amazing. Uh, currently, we're not uh, we're not looking at projects like that. Something which some people refer to as smart property. We're looking at uh, assets that are backed uh, by trust. Okay, really, uh, which so- 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 something that sounds uh, antithetical to the whole philosophy of Bitcoin, of course. But uh, uh, there are uh, there are organizations, there are companies that are trusted in, in what they do and they want to use uh, cryptocurrencies to be able to attract for instance let's say investment from all over the world they want be they that way they also their assets can be traded in a decentralized way uh, it's not the final solution if i may say hey what we're uh, after uh, here is more about uh, an intermediate term solution where um, for instance, a government or uh, a large uh, corporation or uh, a trust corporation issues one of these currencies, and it can be issued to their. It can uh, users of those assets can acquire this 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 uh, these coins and then trade them among themselves. So we we don't give a solution to the <laughs> ultimate problem. That is how to link it with the but that is blockchain. A, yeah, I mean that's. That's another one of these holy grail, holy grail questions that someone's going to answer someday. I would doubt it. Seems. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, definitely a very interesting topic. I, I would say uh, we would like to come back really frequently to the idea of the uh, cryptocurrency research center uh, because there's so many <laughs> interesting problems, and uh, having a group of people, and ideally constantly expanding group of people who could focus on problems like that, uh, 
finding out what the current state of affairs is in any in any area is tremendously useful. For instance, I know very little about smart smart property and smart contracts, uh, but uh, because essentially I do not really have the time to learn about them. But being part of a cryptocurrency research center where research can be done at a high level, uh, at a deeper level, I would be able to learn know more about it. <laughs> yeah, I do. I understand exactly the uh, your position. And, you know, where I am, I, everything I learned is from, learn is from talking to people <laughs> because, frankly, that's the uh, that's the best way to do it. You know, when you try just leafing through endless pages of forums, which is where the real information is, uh, it just takes too long for me. Right, right. Mm-hmm. I have to admit I re- uh, rarely visit forums because it's um, it requires so much time for very little return. Yeah, sometimes, I mean, also <laughs> personally, I'm a poor reader, so yeah, you know, I can I've, I've spend tons of time on forums, but I uh, but it just takes me so much longer to get through it than um, than listening, which is what turned me on to the idea of producing a podcast. Oh yeah, that's so makes Panos, sense. what's your uh, do you have any interesting projects in cryptocurrency at the moment? Well, the, the main was uh, the one I mentioned before uh, regarding uh, the page, uh, uh, regarding the, the way the, the economy of uh, the crypto economy works. This is the main, the main aspect I'm really interested in right now. And uh, I'm really, seeing any resources yes? that... Uh, not, not yet, not yet. I'm um, in the preparation stage right now. I believe in uh, one one month's time uh, there'll be something. I'm out. really fascinated just to uh, to have a look at what you've come up with because it's a really sure. it's an awesome sure, uh, sure. it's an awesome subject. Really, uh, yeah. I think it's a subject that uh, a lot of people are interested in. Uh, apart from the from the technology, well, not many uh, really understand the technology. Uh, most see the price, and they are interesting that uh, well, only in the the way it fluctuates. Uh, but uh, it's really interesting to understand the the mechanics, uh, the, the how mass psychology actually works in order to to see all these fluctuations. Do you have any kind of interesting, just off the cuff observations? I, you know, I've personally I I'm familiar with these these cycles of investment and then a project's release it booms it busts and then builds up again and you see the cycle going on and on but uh, have you noticed any top level obvious mechanics that take place uh well actually i do trade uh, uh, and uh well i don't use any indicators uh, i trade uh, naked as they say with no indicators and i'll just walk what's, uh, what's the price uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the technical analysis. Apart from uh, the cycles, uh, all you have to do is uh, just look at a, a graph. And, uh, well, if you, if you can read it, uh, it actually tells you a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. And, and the, the longer the time frame is, the better. I, I'm, I'm referring to, to daily, uh, maybe weekly candlesticks. Okay. Uh, the, the lower I would go down and what uh, would be four hour candlesticks if uh, well that's the lower one and, and I would say as a non-expert in technical analysis what uh, Panos had told me and it's not that I can take advantage of it but <laughs> uh, he has told me that markets uh, in the cryptocurrency space they tend to be less manipulated am I saying that right and then fundamental technical analysis um, uh, is easier to apply to those markets. Is that correct, Panos? Yes, uh, well, I'm referring to the, the major ones in capitalization. Oh, yes, uh, yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Not the small ones. Not the small ones. So but, I, uh, they, they, they work pretty good, yes. Technical analysis works pretty good with Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Peercoin. Because I, I suppose those small, there's so much paranoia in the space, but uh, especially because people carry their observations from smaller smaller coins with these whales perpetually just trying mm-hmm. to, to milk everything they can out of them and they carry those experiences over to larger or those attitudes that they've gained from those experiences to larger larger currencies or you know with greater caps and uh and yeah i i've, I've wondered if uh 
if the paranoia is really warranted. But I guess, in your opinion, it's not so much, Panos. Well, I guess uh, this goes with uh, the whole uh, free market peer to me peer technology that uh, a lot of people uh, make uh, contrast in their mind. They say, well, this is a technology that's peer to peer, so it's uh, free, so everybody should uh, use it. And then you have, uh, if you have any manipulation that goes uh, against the whole idea and maybe this is something that doesn't work. These are two things that don't work together. Uh, regarding the price, uh, I, don't, I really haven't understood uh, if uh, it is manipulation, if it's real, uh, you know, uh, people really want to buy or not uh, yet. I mean, the last article uh, that went out uh, regarding the the raw robot uh, trading on empty gox, uh, driving the price uh, up in the last uh, uh, November rally. Well, you don't really know what to believe. Well, there's just so much going on there. Mm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> especially with, especially recently, it's been so um, so volatile. But right, just wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess we've covered a bunch of pretty good, um, pretty good ground uh let's see what else i had on my list of things i wanted to ask you guys um uh so yeah okay this is i guess this is the big uh the big question and you've already covered at least part of it but what applications do you guys see for blockchain technologies and in particular second generation cryptocurrencies in your respective professional fields I, I guess I'm thinking in terms of uh, your um, your scientific background, um, Nikos, and Panos. I suppose also, I always envision um, like you were guys were talking about uh, backed assets before, uh, using blockchains for recording other information, account balances that are unrelated necessarily to cryptocurrency. I suppose. Do you guys have thoughts on uh, on applications like that? I have some application, uh, some ideas about how uh, cryptocurrencies can be used in, let's say, in sci a scientific setting. Uh, one of the um, ways by which science is produced is through peer review, uh, and uh, the peer review system uh, now works more or less. <laughs> uh, it, uh, it it can be improved, and the way by which any source of knowledge, I believe, or any research paper can be peer-reviewed, can be revolutionized uh, by uh, cryptocurrencies. For instance, currently the way that one, that uh, research is uh, disseminated in a scientific paper is someone writes the paper and then uh, submits it to a, a certain journal, and the journal assigns one or two editors to review that work. Sometimes only one is willing, only one editor is willing to contribute a review, <laughs> Uh, so uh, sometimes peer review does happen, but uh, it's definitely quite limited. On, on the other hand, the, the, the reviewer might not be an expert in the subject that uh, that uh, research is on, so they they have to make some some decisions that are uh, you know educated choices, and uh, the system could be definitely be improved. And I see that. Uh, as a way to produce not only uh, to disseminate knowledge that has already been produced, but also to produce new knowledge. Uh, I believe that's kind of a, a fundamental change that can happen in the fabric of science when uh, reviewers are assigned and they get a reputation score, and there's even layers of reviewers that review the uh, review of the reviewers, if I may say that. <laughs> Uh, until uh, a specific uh, financial uh, goal is met or a financial, uh, I would say, a goal set by the protocol is set. I believe that we make participation to science and review of work in science um, that, that will change it dramatically. Uh, a reputation will not only be based on who knows whom, but also on real <laughs> contributions and I, I did start a little experiment about that uh, as a I'm the chair of the Bitcoin Foundation of the Education Committee of the Bitcoin Foundation and I started a little experiment where uh, any 
uh, work that needs to be produced by the education committee is uh, is done through GitHub, and uh, anybody who contributes there gets uh, gets credit for that work, and uh, be making, in other words, the production of educational materials much more uh, open and open to not only contributions but also to critique. So. I'm, I'm very interested in that, and I see the application in science as uh, as very important. By mission, by actually seeing who uh, who's created the the work in GitHub, you can also you can also assign, I guess, track productivity and the quality of the of the work produced by the yeah producers. yeah ideally ideally. So uh, you would like your work your uh, your work to be judged by someone who has experience maybe in the same area that you do, that has a good reputation. Reputation systems, I think, if I were to give a, just a simple term, I would say reputation systems in science and in content creation are is the area that interests me the I most. I totally agree with you, Nikos. That is something that seems, that's another kind of crack thing that seems to have slipped through the cracks is the power of blockchains for measuring reputation in an accurate and applicable fashion it's to me that seems like something that we really need as opposed to say a credit score that can be damaged by um, a missed bill payment or damaged by an institution that can't then turn around the or that doesn't then turn around and correct its correct an error that may severely undermine uh, your credit rating. I don't speak from personal experience, but I do know people who have suffered um, who have suffered from things like this, and and also yes, just yes. the ease of use and just this. It makes such good sense to attach all reputation systems to a blockchain if they're of any importance. It seems like they should also be attached to the most uh, you know to a trustless system that doesn't require. It is a reputation system. You know, you don't want trust mixed in there currently trust is offered by centralized organizations in the in the case of science by publishers of scientific journals and if that could be decentralized that mm. i think that'd be very very uh, important what about you panos do you have any any thoughts on the subject well i haven't gone uh, that deep as nikos in that subject uh well all i can say that uh, i'm really amazed with the blockchain technology and uh there are so many things that, uh, well, they can and I, they probably will be implemented uh, on that technology from uh, voting uh, to passport, uh, uh, just getting your passwords on the blockchain in order to, to store them. Uh, there are so many things that, uh, well, just uh, waiting and seeing. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, what uh, can be decentralized uh, will be it's going to be it's going to get decentralized. In the end, it does seem that the end. through a process of accretion, that the decentralization will uh, will just win in the end. I guess that's Darwinism. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and your your work uh, creating a podcast and uh, our work creating educational material and everybody else's work in contributing to different forms uh, can help uh, move that a little faster. Absolutely. Maybe move it forward. We do what we faster. can. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, right. Nikos, you're working on um, on a uh, on a research center, and Panos, you're developing uh, or you're studying the actual function of these. Uh, of the of these crypto economies are there any other are there any other things you guys would like to talk about before we wrap this up actually by the way we work on same products and similar projects together so the research center we we work in collaboration and uh there, there's many things that we work together with because uh it's although we're working in uh, technology that doesn't require trust <laughs> working on it <laughs> is uh, requires tracks the more people and <laughs> this is something that we have developed through through time with yeah. with partners <laughs> so yes ideas are plentiful um uh, would like i would like to share any more be before because some of those are maybe a little immature but uh, uh i don't know whether punish wants to contribute anything else uh no not really <laughs> okay <laughs> this has been a really productive conversation guys um 
thanks for getting in touch. I'll, uh, I'll, I'm really interested to hear anything about what you guys are coming up with in the future. Yes, yes, yes. And okay. ha have a great day, Arthur. Uh, beginning of your day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I will. <laughs> See you later, Nikos. I'll catch you later, pal. Okay. Take care. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Hey, how's it going, Joseph? <laughs> Excellent. How are you? Yeah, I'm great. Good. Cool. Are you actually in Oz or uh, New Zealand? Or oh, beautiful. Yeah, it's gorgeous. I'm jealous. I've always wanted to go there. Maybe sometime soon. I wouldn't be quite so jealous of the time zone. <laughs> so, what do you have in mind? Well, what kind of sparked my interest in uh, getting in touch with you was I read an article in Epoch Times where you talked about these consensus systems standing in opposition to hierarchical organization mm -hmm. and also the use of blockchains to facilitate real estate transactions. What are your views on... Uh... My view in a soundbite is universal disintermediation. Any sort of system that exists currently as a centralized system um, potentially has efficiencies, um, is potentially wonderful from the perspective of the people running it and benefiting from it, um, but it potentially has vulnerabilities as well in that, uh, in that internally it can be corrupted by, say, a CTO or, or a CFO um, who wants to um, force their agenda on, on a company or a system or, you know, potentially implement fraudulent billing practices. Um, it can be co-opted or um, manipulated in various ways by governmental and quasi-governmental agencies. Um, it can choose to engage in censorship, as PayPal has done um, a number of times yeah. with uh, um, WikiLeaks, for example. Um, so um, there, there are are good arguments for taking certain, and I would say that this applies to a lot of different systems, um, certain aspects of the businesses or, or just pure online businesses um, that are constructed in a centralized fashion now with a, a set of servers maintained by a set of human beings and re-envision the architecture to be distributed on a blockchain and allow consensus-based mechanisms to operate the business logic um, and so your your cloud in that situation is um, is the blockchain and you, you actually have virtually no deployment costs because you're not paying for servers or anything the uh, the security of the network and the processing power of the network and storage and bandwidth of the network are all provided by miners um, and the system as a whole pays the miners to secure uh, the network and provide those resources. So, you name it, you can re envision it. Insurance, uh, financial products, banking, um, your own, storing your own information. So, instead of um, having an entity like Facebook monetize your personal identity and communications, um, you are more in control of your own information and you can choose how and with whom to share information with, with great granularity. Uh, and if you want to monetize your own information, um, that's fine. Uh, you can choose to, um, in, in whatever ways will emerge, you can choose to sell pieces of, <laughs> of your ID or reputation um, to appropriate buyers. I, I guess they would be advertisers in, in many cases. Um, and there is no intermediating party taking a cut off of your ID. Uh, same same way with banking systems. There's there's no need to to have a middleman um, either forming pools of capital and making investment decisions or just taking people's deposits and and choosing to put them into you know highly leveraged 
instruments. Um, everybody will be able to, when those systems are built out, to control their own finances the same way they control their own ID. To be uh, to play devil's advocate, I'm wondering these intermediary parties they form essentially a point of resistance that slows down the movement of uh, of resources and in my view maybe i'm uh, maybe i'm misunderstanding this but provide a bit of a buffer and i'm yep. wondering when we increase the liquidity and the ease of movement of these resources yeah fluidity sure. fluidity is that the word i'm looking for what happens it seems like you uh, you open the potential for some really rapid market movements and uh, and unforeseen consequences absolutely well i mean we have unforeseen consequences in in slow and efficient markets too um and so yes uh, the future is unforeseen um but i would argue that uh rapid rebalancing mechanisms um uh economy at the speed of light basically will be much less likely to get into the gross imbalances that we see in the current economy and uh in our our physical meat space world is um massively unbalanced in many many ways and it's an unstable system that will probably uh that is in in the process of of a cascading collapse i hope hopefully it'll be slow but uh but those things tend to go nonlinear at some point. I I completely agree with you there. That's uh, that's entirely my gut feeling or instinctual view of of what's going on, which is what sparked my personal interest in Ethereum and Bitcoin and all of these technologies. What I'm really trying to understand, though, in my own mind, is what this world governed by highly fluid transactions and highly fluid assets. What that will actually look like. Well, it looks like this world compared to a hundred years ago, um, much more productive, much more efficient, much wealthier. Um, you're you're providing people with faster feedback, better information, more information, um, and when people have all the information they need in in a timely fashion, they tend to make good decisions for their own agendas. And if everybody's making positive, productive decisions for their own agendas, and there isn't information, um, asymmetries in siloing of information, etc., um, then everybody wins. It's a, it's a set of interacting positive feedback loops. To get from here to there, these things seem to tend to move in leaps. Some major event causes a, uh, a shift to a certain point. At least that's how I, how I envision this. I, I wonder what... Well, I, I, I do agree that, that there are paradigm shifts but every time you usher in a new paradigm um, the old world doesn't die or transition abruptly um, uh, you still have people living the way they're comfortable living um, the legacy banking system legacy currency systems aren't going to go away there will just be opportunities created by by the newer systems um, different ways of of creating business models, different ways uh, in which people can move money and identity, etc., around the world, um, and these new ways will—they're revolutionary in a sense, but they'll just carve out niches where they're cost-effective or where they're more effective in terms of privacy or security, or they offer some functionality that's impossible in the legacy system, and it's just—it's gonna move rapidly i think but uh it'll be a logical progression it'll it'll happen in layers you, you've seen it uh with bitcoin basically consensus based mechanisms were invented um and people um marveled at the idea for a while and then tried to figure out ways to make it more usable um and then really tried to or trying to figure out ways to just put it in the background and so people don't have to think about the mechanics of it and just think about uh, what they want to do. I want to move some value between New York and Geneva. Uh, I don't care how it gets there. And uh, leave that to the technologists and the, the business developers to figure out how to use this new technology. Um, the user interfaces, the user experiences have to be elegant and compelling.
Um, it's one of the things we're really trying to focus on for Ethereum. I guess the next big burning question that uh, thought, or the next thing that really sparked my interest in that interview was the idea of consensus standing in opposition to rule by hierarchical authority. Sure, sure. So um, a long time ago, we, we lived in small groups um, and information was uh, easy to get, really rapid. Uh, and uh, if you were in a tribe or a small village, you could pretty much get a sense of everything that's going on all the time. Uh, certainly there were, it wasn't perfectly instantaneous, but in, in a context like that, it was easy to form consensus and, uh, and to govern by consensus. And, and certainly there were, there were hierarchies to some degree, but much less so than you find these days. Um, as civilization expanded, um, we, uh, grew more geographically diversified and information got siloed. Communication between different groups became expensive and slow. Um, and so the appropriate organizing principle in a context like that is hierarchical top down. Um, that's how you discriminate, distribute and, and acquire information and control, um, most effectively. Um, these days, and, and that's, that sort of organization is really great if you are a major stakeholder or control it in some way. It's not necessarily as, as distributive, um, or fair for all of the people in such a hierarchy. Um, with the advent of the internet and especially blockchain technologies, uh, we now have the ability to communicate very, very quickly, um, very, very inexpensively. And we have the ability to nearly instantaneously form consensus on issues uh, in a way that's that's trustless. You don't have to believe somebody. Um, you don't have to um, know them. Uh, and malicious actors can even be involved and, and still you pretty much get a consensus. Um, and so being able to apply those technologies or build on those technologies uh, will enable a new organizing principle. So we uh, um, certainly we're not going to leave hierarchies behind, um, but things will flatten very significantly and things will become more consensus based rather than top down control based. And how do you envision this changing the day to day life is not the word I'm really it's not the phrase I'm really looking for, but how do you envision a change for the everyman, our current institutions that we're familiar with? How do you see them evolving to adapt or adapting to the new, to a new paradigm? Um, so I, I think it'll, it'll come on reasonably slowly, uh, and it will, it will make sense at each step. Um, people will take better control of their finances, more control of their finances. You're seeing that already as, as people use Bitcoin. Um, as we build systems on top of Ethereum for distributed ID, uh, reputation systems, etc., cetera, um, we will, there will be a variety of really interesting offerings, some of which we can conceive of already and are working with people to, to design and build, um, and some of which... Uh, we can't even fathom at this point. Um, one of the things, one of the principles of Ethereum is uh, non-discrimination. So uh, it doesn't matter where you lie on the political spectrum. It doesn't where, matter where you lie uh, on the business spectrum. Uh, Ethereum will be available to you to use and build on just the same way that anybody can use the internet and build on it. And uh, Ethereum will be a non Nonpartisan platform controlled by a nonprofit foundation. Once we build it, um, uh, in terms of interacting or, or relationship to the legacy world, uh, we are going to do our best to build tools that will make it um, easier for existing organizations to build some operations on the blockchain. So. Uh, entities might want to see their books become public and transparent and, and auditable on the blockchain. Um, entities, uh, like banks or, or other types of financial companies, insurance companies, hedge funds, um, might want to issue instruments, 
uh, on the blockchain. Again, totally transparent. And those kinds of entities have, have very different requirements from, uh, let's say, a publishing system or, or some sort of game on on the network. And they will, if they need people's ID in the form of AML and KYC, then they can build that on the blockchain too. So um, it's it's up to different groups, and and I'm aware of some pretty big players in in different aspects of um, branding and financial industry, etc., um, who are really thinking about how to. It's very early days, and they're still trying to understand the technologies, but they're thinking about how it might improve some of their processes. Would you be comfortable uh, talking about these? Organizations that are interested in uh, in using nope. blockchain. No, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I figured uh, I figured there'd be a name drop if you were comfortable. Yeah, yeah, it's it's just it's a bit early, and and these are groups within different organizations that are uh, dreamers and believers and philosophically in sync, um, and they will experience some resistance in their organizations. So uh, we want to do everything we can to support them, and, and we want to do nothing to thwart them. Of course. <laughs> uh, I have another question that's um, completely on a different, uh, a different tack. I've been talking a lot to the guys at BitShares, and um, in a sense, it's I see cryptocurrency personally through the lens of their philosophy and their their design philosophy and they have been moving to a less and less distributed more and more kind of structured decentralization for the sake of efficiency uh, including um, including proof of stake as opposed to mining and i know that ethereum is intending to implement some kind of mining uh, is this a consensus a consensus tool or more a a uh, currency an distribution issuance tool. issuance tool yeah, yeah. sure um, well it, it certainly serves as both um, primarily it's a consensus tool but we we do as you're implying it is really useful to think of them as as different um, elements and if one tool manages to accomplish both goals then great um, but you can certainly tease them apart and and uh, have, say, a proof of stake uh, have nothing to do with a consensus mechanism or a processing mechanism have nothing to do with issuing any currency. And so um, we've been uh, working hard, thinking hard on the issue of building a hybrid proof of work, proof of stake system, because um, certainly efficiency is a big issue. Um, and there's not a lot I can say concretely on that right now because the ideas, there, there are a bunch of viable ideas that we've been working with, and we're just trying to figure out the, the costs and benefits of the different systems that, that we're um, kicking around. Uh, in terms of, yes, centralization to some degree has efficiency, and um, Ethereum 1.0, will be quite inefficient. Um, we're going to build a system that has a great user interface, user user experience, etc., has all the right components, will enable businesses to build out their business models and services. Um, on the system, there will be a, a very elegant app store experience for the user so they can do one-click installs in, in their user client. And, their user client will really be a node on the network, so if they want to flip on mining, they can do that. Um, um, also, just the business models will be able to to put together um, beautiful, elegant HTML, CSS, JavaScript interfaces. Um, so that's that's version 1.0, um, and the inefficiency there lies uh, across a few different dimensions. One. Uh, blockchain bloat. Uh, we're about a hundred times more efficient than than Bitcoin in terms of storage, but we're doing at least a hundred times more things that Bit than Bitcoin can possibly do. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so uh, we're we're trying to store programs on the blockchain also. But but just in terms of transaction storage, we're much more efficient. Um, 
And so blockchain bloat will be an issue for probably every successful system in this space. Um, we're trying to, uh, th this is not so much an issue for Bitcoin, but uh, our block time target is one minute. And we're trying to, if we're successful, we're going to be trying to jam a lot of computation into that one minute time frame. Um, and of course, all miners store all information and all miners process all transactions and execute all computations. So there's massive redundancy, possibly wasteful redundancy there. Um, and um, the way to take care of these situations um, is in the short term, pricing mechanisms will take care of them in, in 1.0. Basically, the price of the price that a miner will accept for for including this transaction and the associated computation in the next block um, will rise and rise if the resources are are um, tight. Um, so, so there is that that um, pressure valve, um, and. Um, the problem with that, with using that mechanism, is that uh, if we are very successful, um, it may turn viable businesses uh, less economical, and so it could put a lot of difficult business pressure. Uh, let's say a year into the system, if it's getting very popular, uh, could put a lot of pressure on different businesses that are operating fine until their costs increase. Um, so. Uh, we are in the process of forming a cryptocurrency research group. There are um, a number of luminaries. Um, you can see some of them on our website uh, from the fields of cryptography, uh, cryptocurrency, economics, law. Um, and we will be working closely with uh, these different labs around the world to solve the difficult problems in cryptocurrency. And um, basically, we're going to need to... In to invent sharding mechanisms that will enable um, efficiencies in storage and computation. So the way it will look is um, a subset of miners will process a subset of transactions um, and a subset of a different subset of miners will verify a subset of transactions. And, and so you'll be able to distribute uh, work more efficiently across the network while still Ideally, maintaining a single unified view of the network. And, and so there, there may be mechanisms in the way Ethereum is designed at a deep level that will enable us to regionalize our processing much better, uh, and statistically, really, stochastically. And so uh, uh, it's not a centralization because um, probabilistically it, uh, it works out that it's, uh, it's pretty distributed. When you say... Uh distribute the load so that some miners perform the consensus work and others actually crunch the numbers. Is this a multiple actor approach? Are there more than one type of miner? Is this, uh, is this load balancing? Does this load balancing take place within the system? Um, the load balancing, balancing wouldn't be centrally controlled. It would be economically controlled. So, for instance, um, if it was really expensive, if there's a, a very simple, cheap uh, way to um, process transaction A because it only involves um, uh, local information that you've already got, then you can choose to accept a lower fee for that transaction. If it involves information that uh, will take six hops to get to you, then you may set a higher price or you may just not be interested at all. You won't. You won't. Uh, I, I guess the higher price would would indicate that you don't really have visibility on where that information is, and so you're going to have to get it. Um, whereas somewhere in a different part of this address space, um, there may be a miner who has all of that information, pretty local, or most of the pieces that they need, um, and they can. Um, Assign a lower cost to that operation, and, and they would effectively be the one who uh, who processes it and, and submits it to a an overarching blockchain. But uh, again, research problems. These these are just pure speculations on my part. Speaking of research, I interviewed a fellow Nikos Bentonitis recently, uh, who was 
I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He's he's part of our CCRG. Oh, he is. Research group, yes. Oh, that's awesome. I've been looking at Next recently. I'm, Next is another project that I'm really I've been following quite closely. I found they have uh, well, what they've decided to do is to tackle blockchain bloat is implement multiple uh, multiple chains, multiple parallel chains. Uh, is that something that Ethereum would look at doing? Yeah. So. As part of that sharding mechanism, um, you could imagine that that there will be multiple chains operating uh, simultaneously, and uh, results will be coalesced into a, an overarching blockchain. Um, and one of the so, so it's it's a research problem to figure out how to build applications um, where your uh, your business logic is operating. On a cycle of once a minute, or and and only probabilistically too, so you can't even be guaranteed um, that you're going to get a result within a minute. Although, of course, you can raise your price, um, and uh, if you offer enough to have this transaction processed, you're virtually guaranteed that it's going to be in the next block. Um, and and for lower priority items that you don't need done in the next block, maybe in the next week, then you can you can choose to pay a lower price. Um, but um, so, so that's a hard problem: how to write applications and, and put together caching systems that enable it to appear smooth from the user's perspective. Um, in 2.0 or possibly 3.0, because it's a hard problem, uh, we will certainly look to have um, many, many uh, sub blockchains going on that, uh, that sort of operate in their own part of address space and can get information quickly and inexpensively. And those things, if you have a thousand of those things, and you have in your overarching blockchain's target uh, block time is one minute, then you can have these thousand little mini blockchain workers, and in that in that way, you could actually get sub-second uh, business logic processing. But again, let me emphasize: these are total speculations. Um, not not going to be in in uh, Ethereum 1.0 and may not even make it into 2.0. But uh, um, they're, you know, conceptually it seems reasonable, but there's a huge amount of work to be done to to build a scheme like that or something different and maybe better. Could you, you mentioned uh, sharding. I was, I'm a total, I mean, I literally swing from trees for a living. I'm a complete layman. What do you mean by sharding? Uh, it's a database technique for for slicing up data um, sort of vertically in columns of a database just for uh, easier access. It can be used for different reasons. Uh, easier, faster access, regionalizing um, data, and therefore speeding responses of systems. So you're, you're basically taking a single unified system and slicing it up behind the scenes to operate more efficiently in one or more dimensions. Um, while still, from the user's perspective, maintaining a single unified view. Okay. Does that make sense? It does make make perfect sense. One thing I've um, I noticed talking to talking to the guys or one of the fellows at Next was that they had uh, they didn't organize specifically. Uh, in fact, they were highly anarchic initially, and gradually these committees coalesced in order to solve specific problems and they found that gradually as with more and more actors working essentially without undirected they managed to get a lot done and select the best what well, you know and the best stuff wound up being sure, distributed and, top, sure. and yeah. employed it does yeah and ethereum has this uh I hesitate to use the word centralized because it seems like a bit of a four-letter word uh, at the moment. But Ethereum has this core group that uh, that's organized together, and I'm wondering how how you feel those two different uh, models compare. I think and we're almost exactly like Next. Uh, we we are still a volunteer contributor project. Uh, we are open source. Uh, we formed spontaneously. Uh, we've added a little bit of organization and a lot of uh, different project capability. Um, we do have a group that's, that's uh, you know, it's not 
it's not a deep hierarchy, but we do have a group that's sort of an oversight group that's trying to make sure that all the different pieces happen, legal, se secure storage of funds, uh, development of the core infrastructure, maintenance of the website, communications, um, uh, just a million different things um, that's required um, to build a big project like this. And Bitcoin was an experiment. It, it was formed in a context in which nobody was watching and it had time to um, evolve and grow and debug itself and and uh, there was no pressure really. Um, we are under enormous scrutiny um, and we are building a, a fundamentally different kind of uh, system. Uh, Bitcoin is is a brilliant system for transmitting value and storing value, and I think it's going to remain the better or become the bedrock of the financial system, hopefully for the planet. Um, but we're different. We're we do have a token like Bitcoin. It's called Ether, um, but we are building a distributed application environment, and uh, we are competing with uh, other entities who. Uh, who have application environments not necessarily distributed and consensus based like ours. And so we need to be on top of the latest technologies providing the best user interface and user experience. Um, and we need to keep evolving too. So you do need to, um, we, we have a very, very much a bottom up approach, but we do have, uh, in a bottom up way, we've developed a mechanism for sharing information and overseeing the different facets of the project. And, uh, yep, we need some organization to, to make this bigger and better. Because at the end of the day, there are just some tasks that are better suited to, sure. as, to a central group as opposed exactly. to. Exactly. And, and we, we really are just a, a bunch of disparate groups that talk to each other. Um, uh, they, the core, there, there are a couple different core software development groups, the web group, they, they just all, they're working on their own projects. And what we do share is an overarching goal. Um, and that is to build Ethereum. We, it's a, it's a philosophy and it's, a, it's an application environment and hopefully ecosystem soon. Um, and, and we're totally in sync on what that goal is. A lot of the time, we're not so in sync in, on some of the sub goals, and we've been very good at, at getting together and and forming consensus and moving forward on on even some issues that that have been contentious. But uh, I'm pretty impressed with this group because they're uh, uh, respect all of them very much. Very smart group of people and very dedicated. Um, and we're all we care enough about the project and the vision to um, to go through and into those difficult discussions and and come to a better solution. And so far, it's worked. You guys do seem highly co highly cohesive, and um, and re it's interesting you use the word respect because I know that certainly Ethereum is highly respected and highly scrutinized at the moment uh, as being one of these holy grail projects. Well, uh, let me just say, let me stop you there. Our cohesiveness is an emergent property and it, it, it emerges out of chaos, really. It, it's uh, um, it, Inside, there is a lot of different opinion um, and we have been able to talk it out and stay, stay coherent. Um, and uh, I'm glad that the world is, is seeing this project as, as being cohesive and coherent. Um, internally, it's very organic and dynamic. As it should be. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's really quite natural the way you're describing next. So CS is quite similar. Well, this is actually a ton of stuff for me to digest. I could keep talking to you forever. But um, for now, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. And cool. do you mind if I... Cool. Well, loved your approach. Happy to, to help any further if I can. Yeah, hey, fantastic. Thanks a bunch, Joseph. Well, uh, I hope to talk to you again in the not-too-distant future. That's all we've got today. Check out the Beyond Bitcoin Show subreddit for information on the aforementioned Hangouts. For recordings of said Hangouts and other tidbits, go to beyondbitcoin.fm. 
you can contact me, Arthur, at beyondbitcoinshow at gmail.com. Thanks to all the guys who have made this possible. You know who you are. CSIS provided the groovy tunes. And finally, thanks to Adam Levine for developing the LTB platform. What a legend. Tune in for more scintillating conversation next week.